today and everybody that's on the call today. Thank you for morning, man. But we're just so grateful to you for meeting us. Meeting us at six o'clock in the morning on Thursday morning. I mean, I look so forward to these conversations. I pray, Lord, you will bless our time and allow us to learn, allow us to grow, allow us to uh, receive. Because Lord, we're really not interested in anybody more than you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, Hilo. I want to continue talking about uh, truth. That's all what I'm talking about today. I know I've talked about it to some degree in the past, but God just keeps unveiling this thing. He keeps making this thing more and more rich. As a matter of fact, if you have a Bible, I want you to turn to Hebrews, the sixth chapter and uh, the 17th verse. I'm not going to read it right now, but I just want you to have it available so we don't have to slow down. Uh, but um, as we have been sharing with you truth, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And I think in this time when God is opening up what we call the spiritual dimension, you see, the teaching of faith must be the consciousness and the awareness of the spirit of God. We have got to become more knowledgeable, more understanding of the spirit of God. We are living in the dimension where God is revealing himself by his spirit. He is spirit. God is spirit. They that worship him must Worship him when spirit and in truth. You cannot know God, interact with God. You cannot relate to God except by his spirit. And the fact that Jesus said that, that uh, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about that because really that is the definition of the Holy Spirit. And as I've said before, which I want to talk a little bit more into the detail, truth is the identity of the Holy Spirit. By that, I mean, truth is the persona of the Holy Spirit, the makeup, the definitive character of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is true. And his essential nature was essence, is truth. At the core of his being, the intrinsic motivation of everything the Holy Spirit does is always in relationship to truth. Okay, oh, I want you to, I need you to get this. Okay, I think I'm gonna put your thing in cap on. Okay, because now look at Hebrews six. It says this: "Where in God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise." the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, two, okay? That, that's uh, his oath and his promise. Promise and oath, those are the two immutable, immutable things. Immutable means, well, I'm talking about um, the two immutable things, look at this, which is, which it was impossible, impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for him to lie. Think about that. God cannot lie. 
He can never say anything that's not true. It says, we might have a strong constellation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Man, let me break this down. Look, first of all, immutable, that's not a word we probably use or even familiar with, but immutable means too unalterable, too irrevocable acts, two things that can't be changed or unchangeable, okay? And what are those two things I said earlier? A promise and oath. Um, it's the inherent nature of God always keep his word. He never fails to follow through on what he has promised. And um, as it says, he, he can't, you know, you don't usually associate impossible with God. That term is never associated with God because God can do anything. Nothing's impossible for God. There is one thing that's impossible for him. It's impossible for him to ever lie. And the reason why that's so important is because anything he says, we can have absolute security, confidence, because we know anything he says ain't nothing but the truth we know it's gonna to come to pass. You see, um, because he cannot lie, it's impossible for something God said to be proven false. Sometimes somebody says something and later on says, oh, no, that wasn't true. No. Now sometimes it doesn't appear true or it doesn't appear as if it's gonna to come to pass. Sometimes the circumstances seem to indicate, hmm, God missed it on that one. Oh, yeah, you know. He, <laughs> hmm, he misthought that one. He said it, but he never, never. And that's the tricky part because <laughs> he calls those things that be not as though they were. You're like looking at a situation or you're looking at something and you're saying to yourself, that's not what God said. That's not, that, that can't be. I'm looking at it right now. God, what are you talking about? That's not, that's not real. That's not true. But guess what? He calls things that be not as though they were. And when he says it, we have to learn that if he says it, he said it, even though it doesn't look like it, take my word for it, it's true because it's impossible for him to lie. When you look at faith in this context, you understand why the Hebrew writer said, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not seen. Faith is the conviction of some reality that is not visible. Faith is grounded in truth, spiritual truth. I call it spiritual truth because truth is inherently spiritual because the source of truth is God and God is spirit. And um, I love this. I was reading this this morning. Uh, he says um, two immutable things possible for God to lie. Meaning that 
he can never break a promise. There can never be a question of God ever deceiving you. He never deceives you. You know, he, um, but then the next verse says, he says, which, he says, which hope we have, listen to this, as an anchor of the soul. Wow, an anchor of the soul. Anchor of the soul. Now you gotta know something about boats and you gotta know something about, you know, the water. See, the water is a very un, um, what should I say, unstable place. Okay, I'm talking about deep water. I'm not talking about the water you can walk. I mean, it's shallow. You can walk on your feet. You know, you can, that ain't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you're out on the water and the water is really deep. You're at the mercy of that water. Okay, and that water can shift and change on you. It's so much, such a great illustration of life. Because you know, life can just switch up on you, change up on you, and it can be very unsettling. Because I mean, one day everything can be fine, next day all hell can break loose. Things can be so unsettled, all out of sorts. And uh, it's those times that you really appreciate God. Those are the times when you really appreciate a relationship with God because I don't know if you've ever been in a storm on the water, but I have been on a storm. I've been in a storm on the water. And let me tell you something. You do not want to be on the water in the midst of a storm because that water will throw you around and you're completely at the mercy of that water. And, uh, and I really thought that might have been my last day, you know. Well, I mean, that's what, you know how you have those moments when you stand down death? I was standing down death that day, man, because that water was throwing, that water was coming in the boat. I was going from side to side. We were hanging in the fellas trying to fish. <laughs> And I um, had taken this class about um, seamanship and all that. But I couldn't remember what they said to do in a storm. I couldn't think of what to do. I just was like, oh, man. So I got my little cell phone. While I'm holding on, I call the Coast Guard. Guess what they tell me? They say, put your anchor out. All that time, I had an anchor. I never used it. I never looked at it. But that was a time. And I needed that anchor. Why? Because that anchor would hold that boat in place. It would lock down to the bottom of that, uh, that river and it would hold, of course it didn't, but I'm just saying that was the purpose of it. <laughs> he says, he says, hope is the anchor of your soul. Hope holds you in place because all around you things are just you know out of sorts. There's a lot of just uncertainty and danger, and you're threatened. But guess what? Chum, hope holds you in place. He says, sure and steadfast. I love those two words, sure and steadfast. And then he says, and which enter that within the veil. I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, we ought to live with a strong consolation. When I say consolation, uh, the um, Greek word for consolation is, is encouragement. We ought to be encouraged. Um, courage means a strength of will. Okay, that's what courage means. Encouragement means to strengthen yourself or be firm in your belief. Okay. Encouragement, a lot of times associated with what somebody does for you. But 
It mainly is about what you do for yourself. How you are able to lock down on the reality and um, just give yourself a talking to. I hope you talk to yourself because there are a lot of times when you need to tell yourself something, okay? Because self will get out of, out of bounds. It'll go too far. It'll operate in fear. It'll get you all discombobulated. And you have to talk to yourself, oh, come back here. <laughs> We're not going there today. We're not going there today. <laughs> I'm serious, you have to talk to yourself. <clears throat> Get real mad. Some thoughts come to your mind. You say, mm -mm, no, 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 we're not done. Vengeance is the Lord. How I many you ever had to do that one? That's a, that's a really important word. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. You got to let the Lord fight your battles. I mean, you know, because you want to take matters in your own hands. Because you remember, don't you? You used to look. Don't start that won't be nothing. <laughs> you know, that's the, you, you just have, you have to defend and fight for yourself, you know? But no, now, uh-uh. We don't do what we want and we don't react in the way we want to react. We do as, we do as what the Lord tells us. But sometimes self's like, all right, let's put that spiritual thing down for a minute. Okay, I'll come back to the Lord later. <laughs> Lord, let me do this first, and then I'll be back with you. No, no, uh-uh, come back here. You're not doing that. You're not going to let your ego get out of hand. He says, um, you know, um, I think it was a Moffat. Moffat describes consolation as the mighty indwelling strength or confidence. Look at that, indwelling strength. He says, who you take refuge in him, claim as your protection. He says, we lay hold upon the hope that's set before us. Another translation says, we grasp or get hold of the hope that lies ahead of us. He see, we seize upon the hope that is offered us. Don't try to write this down. I'm, I'm tell you what, I'm gonna give you a copy of my notes. All right, you know, I already sent it to King. You, you get a copy. You can read it. But I want you to I just listen. I need you to just listen. Okay, don't try to write everything down. Okay, he says. He says, which hope we have as an anchor of our soul, sure and steadfast. Those two words, sure and steadfast. What does that mean? Two things. It means to be secure and firm. That means it holds you and keeps you. You know, it grabs you and then it maintains your position, your posture, sure and steadfast, secure and firm, strong and trustworthy. We have a hope. You know, we have a hope that can never be broken or dragged around. Okay? I mean, it cannot slip and it cannot break. No matter what happens, what circumstances we may be in, our hope remains in place and provides us the stability to withstand and to endure. In other words, faith is the substance of things that are hoped for. Amen. That means I have an expectation. I have an anticipation. I have a sense of what will be. I am aware of what in the spiritual dimension is coming. That keeps me upbeat, positive. That allows me 
to, to know, I mean, to be absolutely certain about what is going to be, what is going to happen. You see, hope allows me to thrive in the present. What allows me to absorb whatever challenges and tests is my hope. I can't be knocked off base because I have hope. I got an anchor. Okay. I mean, I can experience adversity without getting down or getting discouraged or depressed. I can be in the most, um, most less than ideal circumstances, but I'm good. I can be content whatever state I am. Why? Because I have hope. What does the enemy attack more than anything else? Your hope. He wants to build a narrative. You're messed up. This is never going to work. You're done. It's over. That's the, that's the lies he tells you. But you're never over because God can't lie. God can't fail. Nothing he ever said did not come to pass. I mean, you say, well, well what are you going to do about that? Well, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I didn't know what they, God said this. And if God said that, that cannot be untrue. And so I'm, I'm relying on what God said. I believe. And what God said. Now, this is the tricky part. The enemy wants you to go on what you see. He wants you to focus on what other people are saying. How things look. He wants to even point out things from your past. He wants to give you some narrative based on what happened to somebody else. You got to understand those are all lies. Those are all lies. And don't let him tell you what happened to somebody. Tell him when he said that, say, look, I'm not somebody else. That may have happened to them, but they ain't got nothing to do with me. Because, because I operate in truth. And God never lies. I love he says, I can't get bogged down on this one, but I, I got to mention it. I got to mention it. <laughs> he says, which entereth that within the veil. Wow, that's amazing. In other words, it passes behind the veil. What passes behind the veil? The hope. <laughs> the hope enters. Look, look, this is, this is, um, Godspeed, Godspeed. He says this, hope enters the inner shrine behind the curtain. Wow. I mean, hope reaches into the holy of holies. You know, there was like three parts, the outer court, the inner court, and then the veil that separated the holy of holy, the ark of God, the presence of God, only the Aaron C could go in there. But when Jesus died and rose from the dead on the cross, the greatest thing that happened, well, it is finished, my view. Well, I might, I'm going to say the greatest thing that happened. I ain't thought that through, but I'm just saying. <laughs> the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. Whoo! That barrier that caused only partial interaction. It was torn, broken, violently removed. And Hebrews said, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. <laughs> we don't have to like inch up there and like think, oh man, hope you don't see my sin. Hope they don't see what's wrong with me. Oh, he might not accept me. Because you know, in the old covenant, if the priest went in there once a year, 
He did the Ark of Atonement and he wasn't right. Okay? He would die. He wouldn't get accepted. He would go in there to offer for the people and if he wasn't right, you know, and they had this long, like a staff, a stick or whatever. And so if he fell out, they would just reach, because they couldn't go in there either. You can't go in there if you weren't. So they would get a stick and they would pull him out. I don't know of any instances where that took place, but uh, that was one of the provisions. It probably did take place. It just wasn't written in the scripture, but I'm sure there was a priest went in there and he wasn't writing. And then he dropped dead because you can't get in the Holy of Holies and not be right. But guess what? Through the finished work of Jesus, man, we can go where no one could go before. Why? Because we could receive, we can receive the provision of his high priestly duties. Jesus allowed us to have a hope. And he promised us and he allows us to go in and receive. You know, it's funny, he could have just said mercy, but he said grace and mercy. Now, what is not covered by that? We got grace and mercy. I mean, if it ain't covered by the word, it's covered by God's compassion, it's pity. That means it don't even have to be in the Bible. It don't have to be a scripture in the Bible. It could just be God's mercy, you know? Now, I digress. My point is, let me get back to my point. My point is God is infallible. God is perfect. He never comes short of his word. We are to be at ease. Do you hear me? We ought to be comfortable. We ought to be aware that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. That whatever's going on in my life, guess what? I got hope. I'm hoping beyond anything that I can see in the natural. And to walk by faith and to operate in the spiritual dimension means that uh, I'm more generated by what I know to be true and what I sense in the spirit than I am with anything that is visible or is recognizable with my physical senses. I am completely free from any requirement that I have to see anything. That's not important to me how things look or what I have in the natural. All right? It's according to his riches and glory. You know what glory is? Glory is in the spiritual realm. <laughs> I'm not drawn upon what I have in the natural. See, my money ain't coming from my bank account. It's coming from an invisible source. Oh boy, I tell you, I'm getting happy. But in contrast to that, look at um John 8 44. You got that gospel according to John 8 44. I just want to contrast just to highlight the infallibility of God, the fact that He is to be so reliable. God is always true. But in contrast, Jesus says, you're talking about the devil. He says, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father will, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Listen to that. There's no truth in the devil. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Sosa, the origin of it. You always tell the presence of evil because it's not true. Okay? I always tell a false prophet. You can always tell somebody who is not of God, even though they're pretending to be God. And there are a lot of pretenders. You can't tell by the titles. You can't tell by their physical appearance. 
You can't even tell by how they act because they're sheep in wolf's clothing. And they're going to seem really sincere and seem really genuine. But what gives them away every time is what comes out of their mouth is not true. They're liars. And they use superstition. They're operating in. They use superstition and try to promote that to get you to accept their lies. Okay, but it's really not true. It's, and they tell you things, false things. I'm, I've been in a lot of places and I was sitting there thinking, that's not true. And I'm going to sensitize you, you same way. And it's like I said, if the devil tried to mess with you, man, he'd be like, you'd be like, nah, man. Because you know, and when you have tasted of the heavenly gift, can't nobody come study no lies. You know? I was at a conference one time, and the preacher had done a really good message. I enjoyed that message. I was just really beaming from what I had learned. I was like excited and everything. And then this other minister got up, and he was the offering taker upper. <laughs> He, they must have paid him to take up the offering. Every time we had an offering, he would, he would be, and he would, and he just used all of this witchcraft, superstition. He asked me, he said, how y'all much y'all, how many y'all enjoyed that message? Everybody said, yeah, you know. He said, well, if you enjoyed that message, God is saying you need to give $100. <laughs> and I was like thinking, uh-uh. First of all, everybody ain't got $100. Second of all, God can be telling somebody to give $1,000. And you're lying if you're going to tell me that God told you to tell all, everybody in this conference to give $100. That's false. And, and I want you to get to a place where when you hear something that's not true, your spirit reacts. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. You don't let people put you in no witchcraft. You don't put, let nobody put you on the defensive, put you on no guilt trip. People come up with these false and fake prophecies. People come up to you, try to tell you, the Lord told me to tell you, or gonna rebuke you. The Lord told me that you would be you, 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 you. You'd be like, wait a minute, God ain't told me that. And, and that's the thing about these people with these call themselves prophets. Let me tell you something. If somebody is prophesying, three things ought to be happening. Comfort, edif edification, or exhortation. Okay? That's 1 Corinthians 14. I don't know the exact verse. Look, if somebody come up to you and say, the Lord told me to tell you this, and it does not comfort, it does not exhort, okay? And if it does not edify, that is a false prophecy and you reject it outright because God is not on two sides. He's consistently true. And it's nothing but manipulation when people use what they say the Lord is saying to get you to do what they say. You'll never catch me doing that. You'll never catch me putting pressure on you to get you to do something because it's going to benefit me. God forbid I ever do that. But it's a very common practice. Okay? But it's not true. And you need to be sensitive to that. Okay? And I'm not, I mean, I, I, some people are really are sincere. They really think they're helping you but they put fear on you. They put doubt on you. They make you so out of sorts. Let me tell you something. God is not the author of confusion. When somebody calls themselves giving you the word and they confuse you, that's a real sign. There's something wrong with that word, okay? And check your heart. Make sure you, you ain't wrong or whatever. <laughs> but let's just say definitively, God is not the author of confusion. And he's not making you feel guilty. Let me say, explain something to you about guilt. Guilt was addressed at the cross. Do you understand me? There, 
is now there for no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Do you understand? I understand guilt has been a part of your life. I understand you've always experienced guilt, but let me tell you something. The blood of Jesus has cleansed you from all unrighteousness. As a matter of fact, provision has been made for guilt because I'm not denying that you don't mess up, you don't make mistakes, you don't get in the flesh sometimes, do something you shouldn't do. But even then, you don't have to experience guilt because as soon as you realize it, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. At no point at any time should you ever be walking around guilty. And when I say guilty, I'm talking about all of its brothers and sisters, like regret. You're not to have regret. You say, well, Pastor D, I just regret that I didn't go to, listen, stop it. Okay, that's, that's the sister of guilt, remorse. You know, I wish I had, stop wishing and, and feeling bad about what happened in the past and what shouldn't have been. And, and don't let people, let me tell you, witchcraft, I mean, I'm getting off my subject, but I, let me tell you something. Let me explain to you. Witchcraft is mental pressure that a person puts on you to control you. And people who use witchcraft are typically not people that are walking around with a big hat and, you know, the stick, the broomstick and flying around, standing over a pot. They can be somebody like your mother. It could be somebody like your husband, your wife. It could be somebody like your kids. It could be somebody like your pastor, not this pastor, but I'm just saying. <laughs> And you say, well, that's the, how do I know? You know by the method, the methodology of trying to, number one, manipulate your mind, project guilt, force you to do things against your will, assert their will over your will dominate you, control you. Whenever somebody try to control you, you know right away, that's a no. Hold on a sec. No, nah, no. Nah. You know, sometimes you be in a job situation and you got these uh, quotas you got to meet. You got to meet these certain, you know, it's about productivity because it's about money. And, and so, and sometimes as a result of trying to get you to produce and be more productive, they mess with your mind. And so they'd be like making you feel like your value is in how much you can produce. I mean, and like you're depressed because you didn't meet their criteria for what you should have accomplished. And then they try to work you against other people, get you competing and get you feel like you, well, you didn't do as good as so-and-so, whatever. That's false reality. Let me, let me explain something to you, okay? I work here because I need the money. I mean, this is my main support or whatever, but this is not any indication of who I am, what my value is. I don't need your approval. I don't need you to tell me I'm a good person or that I'm, I'm a good, no. Whatever you think about me, that's your opinion, but I know who I am in Christ and I know my value is in the fact that I am a pearl of great price. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a holy nation. I'm a son of the most high God. Ain't nothing you can say and do and ain't nothing gonna happen on this job that's going to ever make me think any less of myself. I am not losing no sleep or what's going on at this job. I'm eating all the food I'm supposed to eat. And when I fast, I fast, but I'm just saying I enjoy my food. I ain't have no indigestion no stress. You know why? You know why? Because I am operating in truth. I'm trying to get back to my subject. <laughs> because, oh, let me show you another verse. Turn to um, 
Turn to First John two twenty seven. How much time I got? Okay, good. I got forty minutes. I got twenty minutes. He says, "But the anointing which ye have received of him." This is First John, the second chapter, twenty seven verse. If you don't have it, don't worry. I explain to you. He says, "But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you." This is not that. The anointing. Now, when we talk about anointing, we're not necessarily talking about the Holy Spirit. The anointing is is a um, is an action of the Holy Spirit. It's by virtue of the Holy Spirit. You can have the Holy Spirit and not be anointed. Okay, but you can't be anointed without the Holy Spirit. You understand? I hope I didn't lose you. But my point is is that the anointing is this special ability to function in a particular way or to do a particular thing. And the Holy Spirit gives you that, okay? He says, you have an anointing that you have received and it's, it's on you, a special ability, okay? You need not that any man teaches you. One of the things that happens is that when people see that anointing on you, they want to take advantage of you. They want to use that. They want to benefit from it. And don't get me wrong. They inherently are blessed by your anointing, by your mere existence. Like, for example, on your job, those people don't realize that your presence on that job helps the environment and has brought great benefit because of the anointing that's in you. For example, you bring unity. You're the light of that place. You're the salt. You preserve that place. There are things that would have happened there if you hadn't been there, but because you're there, you literally have been a hedge and protection. They don't realize it, you know? They think you just is a holy role of just some Christmas. Are we talking about praise the Lord? They don't realize it. <laughs> but it is your anointing. Your family, your husband, he don't know it. He don't know. He don't know how blessed he's been because he was married to you. How many things he's escaped. And sometimes when you tell him something, he don't realize it. He don't realize what you just said to him saved him. It was helpful to him. But don't worry about that. Just Take my word for it. There's an anointing on you. God talks to you. He tells you things. He, he, he shows you how to avoid. He, like when you're in a grocery store, he tell you what to buy. Yeah. And like sometimes you get ready to pick something up and buy something that's spoiled or whatever. And, and someone says, well, put that back. No, you don't want that. So well, I feel like I want your steak today. No, put that back. He said, get this. You don't even know why. Because it's the anointing. And, and so, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie, even as it hath been taught you, ye shall abide in him. The anointing is always true. And it cannot lie. I mean, there is an inherent, intuitive, discerning nature to the Holy Spirit's anointing that he has on you. And you can just sense something. It's not right. It's so I said something. You know, um, because of the Holy Spirit, People can be lying to you and they can be giving you a whole lot of basis for, for what they're saying. And it can sound really reasonable. And your spirit's like, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Has anybody ever been trying to sell you something, right? Because, I mean, let's face it, they're trying to get commission. And they start saying stuff. And it sounds so good because it's just what you need to hear. It's just what you want in that product. I mean, that's just it. But your spirit's like, mm -mm, nah, they lying. They lying. That ain't true. <laughs> Do 
do not, I mean, anytime you make a purchase, any kind of purchase, the Holy Ghost will tell you, nah, don't get that. Or the Holy Ghost will say, yeah, that's a good deal. That's a good deal. Get that. Get that. You know, um, especially those of you who are shoppers. I know that Pastor S is a shopper. But you know, Pastor S has an anointing when it comes to shopping. And I benefit from it because she ain't buying nothing overpriced. Nothing. <laughs> of course, it means we have to stay shopping longer, but I'm just saying. <laughs> we don't associate that with the anointing, but it is. It's the anointing. And the thing about the anointing is anointing is true. And so the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, meaning that the way the Holy Spirit moves is always consistent with truth. He always operates through the medium of truth. By medium, I mean the agency or channel of truth. Truth is the mechanism of how the Holy Spirit does his work. Truth is always the context in which the Holy Spirit works. Consequently, you can always identify when it's the Spirit because it will be true. That means everything the Holy Spirit does is tied, is tied to the transmission of truth. The nature of the Holy Spirit is only to be accessed through the truth. When you're in, listen to this, when you're in truth, you're in the Spirit of God. Let me say that again. When you are in truth, you're in the spirit of God. That means you can only relate to God in truth. They that worship him must, it's imperative that they worship him, what? In spirit and in truth. And when one of the things that... Mm, Got to chase a little bit of a rabbit, okay? <laughs> you see, the misconception of spirit is the big barrier sometimes to us being able to relate to God because the devil, the enemy, knows the power of God's spirit. So what has he tried to do? He's tried to make the concept of spirit mysterious, He's trying to make it scary. I mean, we have a we have a we have a holiday, Halloween, that's devoted to scaring you as a result of spirits. I mean, if that ain't a demonic conspiracy to make you say, "Ah, I don't want to deal with us. I was in the uh, dentist's office the other day, and so. Uh, the lady says, so you a pastor? I said, yeah. She said, I've been looking for a church. I said, really? Yeah. I said, yeah, you can come visit our church. She said, yeah, but let me ask you one question. She said, do y'all speak in tongues? I said, well, I mean, yeah, I believe in speaking in tongues. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I said, man, we don't necessarily do that necessarily in service like Jointly, I mean, people could do it when they're present worship. Oh, no, no, I'm not dealing with no tongue. I'm not dealing with that people's spirit. I, I'm, I'm Baptist. <laughs> I said, well, I'm Baptist too. You are. You Baptist? And I thought about how the enemy really wants us to be afraid of spiritual things. He wants us to stay away from anything spiritual. Why? Because he knows that lights out. When you have the spirit of truth and the Holy Ghost directly, he can't lie to you. Because he tell you something and the spirit say, nah, that's a lie. You just be counseling him at every point. So he doesn't want you to get in the spirit. And so we don't think of spirit as a way of thinking. Spirit is a way of thinking. Do you hear me? I mean, the spirit of something is the way of thinking of something. It's that simple. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth is the way the Holy Spirit thinks, the way God thinks. And when you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you are under the influence of truth. And that is a good thing. 
That's a thing that makes you secure. It allows you to be able to be equipped for life, for circumstances, to deal with change, to face challenges. Why? Because you have the appropriate, well, you know what? Okay, when I say truth, I mean three things, okay? Three things. First of all, what is real? Truth is what is real, okay? What is actual, okay? Not illusion, but what is real? There's a difference between what's real and what is imaginary, what is concocted, okay? All right? And then when we talk about truth, we're talking about what's accurate, precise, as opposed to false, okay? That's number two. And number three, appropriate. When we talk about truth, what is the appropriate, uh, what is the right way to see or perceive something or apply something as opposed to something that's improper, out of place. Those are the three elements when we're talking about truth, what's real, what's actual, and what is appropriate. Okay? I hope you wrote those down. That's not on my notes. But, <laughs> but my point is, is that the Holy Spirit is always revealing to you what's fake and what's real. What is actual and what is false. What is appropriate and no, 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 no. That's not appropriate. That's not proper. That is what the Holy Spirit is moving. And it's important to understand that truth is something that you think, okay? Which time I got? Oh, my time up. Truth is something that you think. It's the reality that you operate in. It's exactly what you are to believe because I start off talking to you about the necessity of thinking Okay, that's what I start off talking about when we first started the series. But I think I told you, and the Holy Spirit corrected me and said, no, 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 no. Then start with thinking. It starts with what you believe. Because what you believe dictates what you think. And when you believe in God, it changes how you think and what you think. And in the days ahead, because my time's gone today, it's critical that you be sensitive to what is triggering what you think. Because what you think must absolutely be based on truth. Any time you are thinking something that is not true, you automatically have flawed thinking, you have affliction, bondage, restriction, limitation, you have every kind of ill effect and you are operating in a false reality. You're misperceiving, you have false assumptions. But what is the cure for all of that? truth. That's why the Holy Spirit is your paraclete. The Holy Spirit allows you to navigate through life and to thrive. Why? Because you operate according to the spirit of truth. Father, thank you. Lord, allow your spirit to dominate. Lord, we want to come under your unction, your influence. 
influence. We want the Holy Spirit to dictate everything today. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. God, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Manna out. <laughs> Manna out. Manna out. Manna out. Manna out.